table. Uh, but thank you very much, Secretary Chertoff. You got us off to an excellent start uh, for the conference. It is now, ladies and gentlemen, a great honor for me to have the privilege of introducing our second keynote speaker of the morning, Under Secretary Martha J. Cantor. Ladies and gentlemen, Martha Cantor was nominated by President Barack Obama on April 29th, 2009, to be the Under Secretary of Education and was confirmed by the Senate June 19th, 2009. Secretary Cantor reports to the Secretary of Education and oversees policies, programs, and activities related to the post-secondary education, adult and career technician education, federal students' aid, and five White House initiatives on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, educational excellence for Hispanics, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. From 2003 until 2009, Ms. Cantor served as chancellor of the Foto de Anza Community College District, one of the largest community college districts in the nation, and was the first community college leader to serve in the undersecretary position. In 1977, after serving as an alternative high school teacher in Massachusetts and New York, she established the first program for students with learning disabilities at San Jose City College in California. She then served as director, dean, and subsequently vice chancellor for policy and research at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office in San Clemente. In 1990, she returned to San Jose City College as vice president of instruction and student services, and she was named president of De Anza College in 1993, serving in this position for a decade until her appointment as chancellor. In 2011, Ms. Cantor was appointed to the U.S. National Commission for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, Cultural Organization, UNESCO, a federal advisory committee to the Department of State that supports worldwide humanitarian developments and values by coordinating efforts and developing, uh, delivering expert advice on issues of education, science, communications, and culture. So you see really someone who's coming from the field of education, from the field of culture, as an American, but really operating internationally. So we very much look forward to your perspectives this morning. The lecture title that Secret Under Secretary Cantor has chosen, Leveraging Cultural Diplomacy for Democracy, Future, and for the Common Good. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Under Secretary Martha J. Cantor. Thank you. Well, I, thank you so much for having me. I couldn't agree more with uh, many of the points that Secretary Chernoff made. And I think we have um, a lot to do on the soft power side through education. And that is really one of the priority goals for the Department of Education in the U.S. government. And I really resonated with your question, you know, why would people flee and how can that be explained to people when many people around the world don't have the context for that intersection of values and ideals and the hard realities of what faces different countries at different times. So, you know, what we're about is really finding not only better existing ways to work together, but new ways to work together. And I can tell you I was president and chancellor of a big community college. We had 45,000 students. And, you know, our, over those 16 years, our international program doubled. And we were sending groups of not only students, but teachers. And I think if there's one point that I, I want to make that I hope we'll think about more together um, in the intersection between soft power and hard power and the realities of different countries, and especially our country, the U.S., which I'm uh, obviously, you know, focused on uh, you know, 24 hours a day pretty much. Um, it, is, it is the exchange of teachers and students, which is why the Fulbright program is so essential to the United States and to the other countries with whom we work, because it's a model for really that in exchange that drills down into the kinds of ideas that professors are thinking about that get transferred to young people like you who can create new ideas that will be grounded in the values of cultural diplomacy, mutual understanding, respect, trust, all of the things that, um, you know, which, which, which really creates that synergy of uh, new ideas so that we can think about ways to really express what we all would like to see, especially in this country, uh, the level of trust increased between Americans and other uh, colleagues around the world. So I think the main message, you know, that I hope that you'll um, think about when you leave these few days of dialogue is really to stay the course, that it is very hard to reach out and build relationships, it takes many, many 
hours of dialogue and discussion and relationship. And one of the things we're trying to do, I was thinking as, as the secretary was talking, uh, I was thinking of, the, of a small microcosm for how we might think about this. Uh, Brenda Gurton Mitchell, the Reverend Brenda Gurton Mitchell, heads up the White House initiative on faith-based and uh, neighborhood partnerships for the for the Department of Education and for the other agencies. We have a White House initiative that is focused on bringing uh, people of different faiths together. And this particular initiative, which is housed at the Department of Education, decided that we should think about interfaith dialogues on college campuses across the U.S. And it sort of gets back to, I think, the, the lady from the Chamber of Commerce, or from, uh, I guess, uh, was it Foreign Relations, um, to think about how could we leverage the power, the soft power of U.S. universities to bring thousands of students together. I know in my own campuses, we, people spoke more than 40 languages. And we had many, many people from other countries and this country and second generation and third generation immigrants uh, getting educated in the community colleges. And if you think about the 26 million Americans who are in U.S. higher education today, uh, and the diversity of those Americans and the fact that they are from all countries in the world. Um, how could we, in this interfaith, in this interfaith effort, bring students together with faculty, with professors, with community leaders, with national and state leaders to think about interfaith dialogue? as a way to build understanding and mutual respect and trust. So members of the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith and the Catholic faith and the whole varieties of faith Baha'i and other faith-based programs that represent many, many people in the US and, and abroad, how could they come together and propose a strategy for campuses that would, first of all, create the mutual understanding and respect, and secondly, put a plan in place to reach out across many faiths, to build an understanding for, in the larger sense, of what democracy means to, to Americans, what other values may mean to other communities of faith that are coming together to these dialogues. So what's interesting is that you can now, we've got several hundred, we have, we have right now in the U.S. 6,700 colleges and universities. And right now we have several hundred, what I think of as very pioneering institutions that have international programs, Georgetown being one of the leaders in this interfaith effort, who are bringing together students and professors on campus to look at questions of value, to look at questions of how am I thinking about peace and understanding and mutual respect? How do I think about hard power? And what is my community of faith about to really extend that thought leadership that we'd like to see, especially among the students for the common good, which is why my title has to do with, you know, what is good? What, what can we create in terms of this work to build under international understanding that will be sustainable? And I think the other word, you know, I'm hoping that we think about in these couple of days is sustainability. You know, federal governments and governments in other countries come and go. We see rise and fall of governments. And what work can we do to build a basic set of, in, in our case, in the U.S. case, you know, democratic values? Maybe, maybe we can't express it in the, in the language of democracy, but maybe we can express it in the rules of law and trust and mutual respect and understanding and cultural diplomacy. So maybe it's part, you know, it's, it's part of our uh, challenge to figure out how to, how to work with our State Department and other experts around the world to create a new language, and that language would be a language that many, many countries could embrace. Um, you know, I, I wrote in my remarks, you know, 50 years ago, um, and actually uh, this, this week, we're celebrating the Morrill Act. Uh, 150 years uh, ago, uh, 1862, the land-grant universities in the United States were established. So this is the anniversary of the Morrill Act today, and our secretary and I are going to be speaking at uh, the Association of Public Land-Grant Universities this afternoon. And those universities were created... Uh, the government gave a, a gift of land. They were created as agricultural entities to really work the land and create an education program among these land grants throughout the U.S. And so, you know, how do we take what President Kennedy sent, said 50 years ago, 
what kind of peace do we seek? He said those words, and they really resonated me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm way older than 50 years old. Um, and, and then he went on to say, not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war, not the peace of the grave or security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, which is why I'm talking about the kind of language we need to create with other countries, with our partners, to create that common understanding for the common good of the global society. He went on to say, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men, I'm editing, putting in women, um, and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, and I mentioned sustainability, but peace for all time. And if we cannot end our differences, he said, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. So those are truths that I think President Kennedy tried to express 50 years ago that are creating a grounding in the kind of democratic values that you know people like me adhere to and many of you. But that language, I think, for what we believe in and what we want for our children and our children's children is really what is so critical for U.S. education at all levels, not just higher education. But higher education obviously leads the way in so many of these conversations for what we'd like to see in the world. And we couldn't have seen, you know, the world shaped so dramatically, and especially, you know, since I was in Silicon Valley for, oh gosh, 35 years, and, you know, the growth of the internet in the last 15 years has been absolutely phenomenal. I actually had to chair a commission, uh, you know, when Secretary Chernoff said about, uh, you know, it's a new world for international security, I had to chair a, a, a big commission to look at fraud rings via the internet in the delivery of education. And it was, and now this summer, uh, the Department of Education is going to actually have a formal rulemaking process to look at delivery of education across the internet and what that will mean for the U.S. and what kinds of security we should be thinking about, and how we can protect, you know, the intellectual capital of the country in ways that are meaningful, and what we should share and what we shouldn't share, and what are the rules of law for the internet, and how can we be careful, but uh, really open to the kinds of ideas that other people may bring to the internet. And so, you know, we, we are thinking in a new world with new tools. And for education, you know, I look at UNESCO and I think, well, gosh, we have 100,000 K-12 schools in the U.S. And UNESCO has a variety of UNESCO schools. They get a designation which has a UNESCO emblem to partner with schools in other countries. So there's a history of the kinds of relationships now that the internet is going to be making available. So children in one classroom, and the president said this when he um, gave his talk um, uh, on first getting elected, you know, his vision of children communicating with children from one classroom to another. I think he said uh, children in Kansas could communicate with children in Cairo. And, you know, the Internet will make, I think, an intergenerational opportunity for more and better education and more and better understanding of cultural diplomacy and the common good in the years to come as soon as we really look at how do we leverage those tools. How do we actually physically connect those schools? We know so many schools, even in the U.S., don't have the broadband that they're going to need. And if you look, I've visited very rural parts of other countries in my, my only three years in Washington and have seen what isn't available in so many countries that some of the urban areas, you know, certainly Washington, D.C., you know, takes for granted that we'll have Internet when we walk into, you know, a public place. We'll have it somehow. We'll be able to get it on our cell phones and, and, and everything else. 
So we've got to look at the new tools that are available to keep ourselves, I think, current and innovative about the kind of language we want to be communicating and the kinds of tools and opportunities, in, you know, in my view, that higher education and K-12 can bring not only internal to this country, because goodness knows we have as many problems as, as many other countries in the world that we see. But, you know, President Obama has said, and he said this really early on, he said this in February, right after a month after he got elected. He said he would like to see the U.S. have the best educated uh, you know, workforce in the world. And what would that mean? What would it really mean when the U.S. has so many people that don't access education? If you look at the last 50 years, today we have 93 million Americans who don't you know, who are at the basic level of literacy in this country. And it's not, and those are adults. Take out the children. You look at 300 plus million Americans. We have 93 million Americans today in the U.S. that did not receive the kind of education to graduate from high school, get at least one or more years of post-secondary or what many countries call tertiary education, and move into the workforce and really be, be able to have the skills to move up and do well in society and be leaders in their communities. So we have a tremendous need now to really better educate this not only this generation, but the next and the next, which is why Secretary Duncan, President Obama, myself, and others are saying, you know, we cannot have a U.S. where a third of children are not ready for kindergarten, where 25 percent in some cities, 50 percent of students are not graduating from high school. We can't have a society today, tomorrow, where we would have, you know, 47% of adults not having the basic literacy levels that our country is going to need and the world is going to need uh, in the 21st century. So in the U.S., we have a tremendous desire to better educate our children and adults at all levels, and we're doing this. We have a lot of uh, opportunities that I don't have time to go into today. But then when I think about our global responsibility, we have got to help other countries think about how to better educate people in much more significant ways than we have had in this last generation. So we have, for example, um, uh, programs like MITx, and MITx is making free courseware that can be distributed around the, the world for people to look at, download, put their own ideas in, shape, and maybe advance. So we see something that we call open educational resources, and, and I think that UNESCO is just uh, having a draft of uh, a policy, a, a program that many countries can, can ascribe to, to share content of courses that will educate people far more quickly when they can get access to the internet. And even if they can't, um, a friend who works often in Pakistan says, you know, we can drop um, computers that are already downloaded with really great content for children and adults to really get the kinds of skills that the U.S. could give, whether it's in healthcare or education or any number of areas, and also receive content from other countries via the internet or, or um, you know, all, all kinds of ways that we can communicate. So we're very excited about that, but I can't say more, you know, the more important remarks about soft diplomacy. Um, I just think that the kind of trust we're going to have to build with countries around the world is going to really be critical, and education has got to be the tool for cultural diplomacy. So our president has said he'd like every American in the U.S. to have at least one year of training or education beyond high school that a high school diploma is not enough, especially when you think about that 93 million Americans and who and who didn't graduate from high school and what we have today. And we've got, you know, the open doors. If you haven't gone to IIE.org, it's one of my favorite organizations, the International um, uh, uh, Institute for International Education in New York. And they talk about, you know, what has happened in international education over the last decade. And students studying abroad is really at a record high. You know, we have students coming here. We have students going there. We have goals for bringing many more students from the U.S. to study in other countries. That's why Fulbright is so important. That's why we need to make the case to Congress that these programs are building the kind of soft diplomacy and the understanding that we're going to need. So we have... Um, 
you know, we have increased the international student enrollment coming to the U.S. by just 6% in 2011 in one year and 32% uh, since 2000. And international students studying in the U.S. climbed by 5%, comprising 3.5% of the total U.S. enrollment during that time. And I know in my own campus, we went from 2,000 to 4,000 international students, you know, within 10 years. So we, we really were able to double many, many more students coming to our country and studying in the U.S. But by the same token, and this is only one example of many um, around the, uh, you know, around the U.S., we are sending many more students abroad, and we really want to meet the goals of sending, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling the number of U.S. students that can study abroad, have a safe and secure environment in which to do that study, and come back to the U.S. and bring, you know, international understanding, peace, and also the ideas that are being generated in other countries. It's interesting. I went to London for a meeting with all the Research One universities, uh, uh, presidents from, from different countries, and this was a meeting between the UK and the US to talk about, you know, what more could we do to support professors studying around the world? And one of the pieces that was so interesting was the fact that co-authored publications of the professoriate are much uh, at, at, at reported in journals at much higher rates than before. So it's really advantageous for us to have our professors studying with other professors in other countries and co-creating knowledge. So if you think about trying to really work on cultural diplomacy, what better opportunity than to have professors studying together in, you know, in the areas of ecology or political science or, you know, any nanoscience. You know, if professors can study together and write reports together and get published in journals together, in this next century, we're going to see much better, I think, new knowledge coming out, and we're going to, in fact, be building in the tools and using the tools to get back to, I think, your first question of, of the secretary. Um, so we want to have more students studying around the world from the U.S. We've created a plan, a strategic plan, an uh, international education plan we'd like to share with all of you at the appropriate time, and I can certainly, you know, we can certainly make that plan available to you. I'm just going to... Um, highlight the five parts, um, the five, five elements of the plan that relate to two goals. We have two goals in our plan. One is to strengthen U.S. education. We're at the Department of United States, uh, Department of Education. And the other one is to advance our international priorities. So we have worked very closely with the State Department on this plan and many, many of the thought leaders around the country so that we can actually have a Department of Education agenda going forward for international affairs and international education. It has five, uh, five areas. Ensure the competitiveness of the U.S., as you might expect, and the workforce in our economy. That's got to be fundamental. Um, increasing, un increasingly educate our own U.S. diverse society. We have so many people coming, studying here, living here and actually becoming even citizens here. So we want to sustain the civic values of our democracy in doing that. Um, promote national security and diplomacy is one of our, our objectives. Collaborate with other nations to address global challenges and talk about the research, talk about Fulbright, talk about all the ways we can do that, whether it's maybe extending the interfaith dialogues I even talked about to, to partner with other universities in other countries. Maybe other universities would be interested in the model that Georgetown and adopted or do it their own way and share it, but it's that kind of interaction. And then more U.S. students with a well-rounded education with foreign language study. And also, you know, my dream is to have every U.S. student in K-12 and higher education go to at least one other country, speak at least one other language, and hopefully do much more than that. So I think, you know, we're talking about increasing global competencies in all of this. That's very central to us. How do we define what a global competency is? Um, that's the new language that we look forward to working with other countries on, on, on really developing. We've got uh, global education in our blueprint for reauthorizing our Elementary and Secondary Act here in the U.S. You'll be seeing in 2014 a proposal for higher education reauthorization in the U.S. We've got all kinds of meetings. Um, we're working on a task force with OECD, for example, that is looking at, uh, it's called a HELO, H-A-H-E-L-O, if you want to go out to OECD and look at a HELO. Um, how can we work with other countries to identify 
common competencies for U.S. higher education, and it's called the Assessment of Higher Learning Outcomes, um, you know, A-H-E-L-O, and looking at, you know, wh what does it mean to graduate from the U.S. institution, you know, we have 6,700 versus institutions in, in other countries. So if you get a Ph.D. in economics or you get a baccalaureate degree or you get a two-year degree, what does it mean? What are the skills you will have, and will you have uh, global competencies expressed in that degree that you earned. So a lot of conversation about that. Um, and then finally, I think I'm just going to um, end my remarks talking about the president and what the president has talked about. He has a 100,000 strong initiative. It's going to dramatically increase the number of students, U.S. students studying in China. There's a 100,000 strong effort uh, in the Americas. We want to have more students, you know, studying in, in Latin American countries um, and having more students from those countries coming here. We've got a Brazilian Science Without Borders International Student Exchange involving 101,000 students today. And so all of these, we have many, many different programs, and what we've tried to do is pull all of that together in our plan uh, going forward. And I can certainly, you know, make these remarks available to you if you want, you know, specific copies of all the things we're doing. I have long lists of, of programs and what we're doing. To, but I think what the Secretary said was so true, we're trying to really pull together an agenda that's comprehensive but clear for the Department of Education, works, you know, closely with our partners at the State Department. I mean, we, we have a very, very coordinated and collaborative relationship with our State Department, especially when we're looking at open education and some of the new technologies and ways that we are going to have to reframe what we're currently doing to be ready for graduating students of the future that we all are going to want to see. So Secretary Duncan and I are, are very excited about all the new developments in higher education related to technologies, and I think you talked about that in the, in the diplomacy and security discussions. Um, Carnegie Mellon is looking, you know, when I, when I met with um, the Chinese delegation at OECD, uh, they talked a lot about how many students were studying in the U.S., and how many students were studying abroad, and how many were learning English, and how many were other at other foreign universities. And I talked about what MIT has done, you know, which was to take the content from professors that professors are freely giving to the internet and making that knowledge available to all around the world who would like to look at what does it mean to have a computer science course in the US or a poetry course um, or a course in, in any other field. And we have new developments, Coursera, Udacity, MITx that I mentioned, um, that are going to really be working in how to share knowledge. You know, Basically, it comes down to what can we do to advance soft diplomacy, cultural understanding, world peace, and the values of this country through the new tools that we have to make education far more uh, available to all. And, and we'd like to better educate not only this country so that we don't have 93 million Americans in the next generation who are low skilled, but we have, we have cut that um, in half. So let me stop there. Um, I'll take some questions and uh, hope invite you all to come to the Department of Education. We are building our plan, as I said. We want you to take a look at it. We'd love you to provide comments. I'll just end with two, uh, two people that I think you know, you'll want to communicate with. Maureen McLaughlin is um, the head of international affairs for the Department of Education. She was at the World Bank for 10 years. She really is the architect of the strategic plan for international uh, education and understanding that I talked about. And the other person is Sylvia Crowder, who is the person that oversees all of our international education programs, whether it's Fulbright or the exchanges or any of the uh, parts that I mentioned. So those are really great people for you to follow up with, and we're happy to um, have delegations. We welcome delegations throughout the year to talk about more what can we do together that we can't just do separately. So thank you for having me and happy to take a few questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Undersecretary Cantor. I thought it was really a very important points. There are a number of very important points you made in your, your presentation. In particular, what I would consider a form of indirect cultural diplomacy. As we look at education and also educational opportunities, what I like about that and why I think that can be a successful way of building trust is it's not saying the USA is like this or the USA is like that, but it's merely providing access to opportunities for individuals to come together and make up their own mind, whether it's foreign exchange or also within our own country, uh, to bring different cultures together. And it's really facilitating that access, which is giving them something that they need and allowing for the cultural diplomacy to take place. So that's why it's actually one of my favorite examples of cultural diplomacy, as opposed to more of the nation branding idea, sort of selling a certain image of a country. Right. So no, very important points, and I think in many ways the future of cultural diplomacy, I think, is going to be going in that direction, I hope. Uh, from yeah, and from I, you know, I think our message is we have a lot to learn from other countries. We don't have all the answers, but we think that the partnerships we can build and the information exchange we can develop and the sharing of ideas that will benefit more and more people to be as educated as we can get them for our you know for our part we obviously want to partner with democratic countries um, but we want to partner with countries that don't understand what a democracy is or why why we value it so much as as the way we are anyway very, very important so no, thank you very much please your questions or your comments here and as always if you could briefly introduce yourself and stand for the camera thanks hi everyone my name is Rupak. Uh, my name is Huma Rupak. I'm from Iraq. Um, I'm at the third stage of uh, uh, studying at the uh, business uh, from the American University of Iraq, Soleimania. Um, as my friends, we all come from north of Iraq, a Kurdistan region. Uh, one of the, my questions is like, um, why uh, America is concerned about uh, having Fulbright, bringing people, uh, students to study in America? Don't you think so if uh, we want just your ideas, it's better to uh, build the, your concentration, American concentration in the countries so that we as a students can get benefit from your ideas and make balance between our community and uh, the ideas that we get from you. Because sometimes when the students come to the status, uh, they just Americanize it and then when they came back, back home, they are just like strangers for us. So that if uh, the, those students are just g having the ideas and having studying and the uh, uh, institutions is much better than coming to the status. For me, um, I came to here in 2008 uh, as one of the exchange programmers. And then I came back uh, last year again uh, just for visiting. And then it's just like it I feel like uh, America be just became my second homeland. And then I'm studying at the American University. I'm so familiar with uh, American ideas and thinkers. Uh, I'm interested in American ideas, and I want to have uh, that ideas uh, across the world, and then concerning on those uh, issues, global issues. Um, uh, education is the way that to uh, attend in all the ways, all those problems, and solving the issues that around the world. But I think it's better to uh, concentrate on the uh, building the situation in the in the foreign countries more than bringing the students into the country. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what I would say is we don't see it as an either or, we need both. We need to send, as President Obama has said, many, many more American students to other countries. And, you know, what I said at the beginning about not only students, but professors. We think that uh, exchanges with professors and their students will be one of the elements of how a 21st century educational exchange could be embraced. And I think it's hard work. It costs more. Um, there are more logistics. We have immigration. We have security issues. So there are all the reasons why you know we haven't uh, you know had as many students as we want to have going forward exchanging both ways. I mean, it's for those countries and our own countries that we have to, and I think what the secretary said was so true, build the kind of trust and understanding that the university a university in Iraq, a university in Egypt can communicate with a, a U.S. university so that the professors, the presidents, all levels, the deans can really understand where the best value and where the best mutual benefit will be. Because as we know in the U.S., um, our universities are like little cities. Oftentimes, I had 45,000 students. My community college was bigger than the city that in, in which it was located. So, you know, we have... 
we have a lot of work to do, and I don't think you know our foreign policy and education would say we only want to want to have uh, students from other countries studying here. We have a big push to get our students out and get them going. I think it comes down to cost and quality and the kind of relationships and the trust building that we need to do with universities abroad and universities here. So I think you know when you go to IIE, our Institute for International Education, or you talk to all of the organizations here in the US, they will tell you we want to bring students and professors to other countries, but we really have to build the alignment between the institutions. We want students to take classes that will get credit for their time spent in another country at a US university. We need to look at, you know, uh, uh, elements of quality so that we are we are working with universities that have quality and can build out uh, the kinds of relationships that you're seeing in a lot of countries. You know, you're, you're seeing U.S. universities wanting to reach out to other countries to say, what could we co-create? What could we build together? Or can we put a branch of our university here in your country and have students there come? What will be best for your country? We don't have, as I said, all the answers, but we're very interested in two-way exchanges. We need more Americans going out, and we need to continue to welcome many, 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 many more students here in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. My name is Marek Wasinski. I am from Arizona State University. And uh, like over the years, I've been teaching at many universities around the world. And uh, from from my perspective, I I kind of think that we are missing one point here. If you really want to achieve this goal, we need to put more uh, more stress on teaching foreign languages in our yes, country. Yes, I couldn't agree because more. Because what, what what is happening that American students, yes, they go to another country, but they study at American university. They take classes taught by American professors. They can't communicate with local people. So what? What, what is really their cultural experience there? So we need to prepare them first to go there to, to really take advantage and be ambassadors of our country and communicate with local people. Yes, and that's where, you know, actually putting more foreign language in K-12 schools is going to be essential. You know, if you look at all the foreign language, you know, how you acquire a, a foreign language, you know, if you can acquire it in elementary school, that's optimal. It's not to wait till the students are in high school to learn a, a language or wait till they enter. You know, my community college, we taught many, many languages. I We offered a Farsi class. I had 70 people who showed up to learn Farsi. You know, there was tremendous interest in learning foreign languages, but we really need to help uh, K-12 education, and that's part of, you know, I oversee higher education and and uh, career technical education but working with our k-12 people we have a proposal in the president's budget that calls for in k-12 a well-rounded curriculum foreign languages should be a part of that again you know schools are decentralized the decisions are made locally and that's why you know I go back to having a more educated uh, school board a more educated community to say foreign languages we are going to demand that foreign languages be taught in our school because it really is the right of states we even have a law that says the Department of Education does not create curriculum or assessments or standards. We work with consortia, and thank goodness that 46 of the 50 states said our academic standards were too low for K-12, and they are lifting up those standards and putting in new assessments and taking leadership to figure out what would a 21st century curriculum look like where can foreign language be embedded? And then when the universities come forward, you know, many universities, I'll mention Chatham University, uh, they are committed to global competencies for every graduate. All the students have an international exchange. It's embedded in the university. It's in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a small university. I think it started as a women's college and it's been around for many, many years. Um, and so students there can come with a foreign language and go right into an international environment in that campus. And we have other campuses that are doing similar kinds of things to become, you know, to, to create much more sustainability 
in the international education effort that these campuses are embracing. And that's why our international education plan is so important. It gives some federal guidance to what should this plan look like and what are the kinds of things that institutions are doing. So IIE is, you know, that I mentioned, they're capturing the international exchanges. What are the outcomes for those exchanges? And what could we do differently? What could we do more of? What could we stop doing because it wasn't an, as effective? So we're also trying to build an evidence base, but I couldn't agree with you more about foreign language. We really need to ramp this up. And if you have great ideas on ways to do that, I mean, learning a language, you know, best can be learned in another country. Um, obviously, we don't have the funds to send uh, the K-12 students to, to another country as much as we would like. We have some, but very, very small numbers. But that's really what has to happen over time is to really have those exchanges at all levels. Uh, three more questions. Maybe we'll start ladies first, and then we'll come to you. Thank you, Under Secretary um, Cantor. My name is Bridget Thibault. I teach at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, and I couldn't be more pleased about your ideas about international education and some of the opportunities that are available or that are in the works. Um, I, I think that international exchange is very important. And part of the, the problem that we're facing um, in college, for instance, on my campus at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, is that as much as there is the interest in expanding or recruiting international students, those are the students also with the least funding to come to the US, and so it becomes a problem. The other thing is that with the students that we have on campus, it's also a problem for them to travel abroad. And so if there could be some flexibility in terms of funding those programs, because very often students who are interested in going abroad have to raise their own money to go worry about the credits that they're going to get, and it becomes really challenging. And so my suggestion would be to figure out a way in this um, 100,000 plan that you talked about to find better solutions to those financial problems <coughs> and to really work with some of those professors who are interested in going, because part of working with Fulbright is that um, there is some of the limitations. If you're not a US citizen, you can apply for certain funds, and so it becomes a problem, even if you've been in this country for 30 years. And so th that is some of what needs to be looked into. But I, I really applaud um, your, your contribution today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I can make a comment that you know the financing of international education programs is very much on our list of things to look at. What what can we do? And I will tell you, um, for example, one of the things that that we have done in the last three years, we have uh, had when I when we came uh, in 2008, we had six million students in the U.S. higher education colleges and universities. Um, who received a Pell Grant. So these are students from America's lowest income families in the country. And today we have 9.6 million. That's happened just in two and a half years, frankly. Um, so if we can find a way, and this was one of the reasons that in building an international education program, in my experience, we said to the campus, anyone who wants to study abroad, um, must be paid for. We must have, just because if, if you don't have the funds, we will work with our scholarship office and philanthropies and any other way so that no student would be denied access to an international education experience. And we worked really hard on that. We worked hard that with the community. We worked hard with the faculty. I will say that the Pell Grant allowed students to continue their education. So if we took an aid or a semester in another country, I sent professors uh, to those universities, they met with professors at those partner universities, and the students were getting college credit for doing that. So I just use that little example as ways that we have to push ourselves on the financing of international education, uh, especially the exchange programs, but also ways that universities can partner with each other to look at the financing to make the exchanges work. I know with the Fulbright, you know, receiving a Fulbright scholar, um, we actually, our Fulbright scholar was able to actually teach some classes and actually earn some income and then help other uh, scholars that she was working with in, in the country that she came from, Uganda. But um, 
that's just another way that we have to sort of stretch our thinking about the financing of international exchange and, and foreign language study in other countries and all kinds of things that we're going to need going forward. Last question? Or, okay. Sorry, I'll try to answer more quickly. We are yeah, very brief. Uh, Sherry Mueller, I'll be teaching a course on cultural diplomacy at SIS at AU. IIE has discovered there are 750,000 international students in the United States now. Um, do you think we're, do those international students, and are there some students, some efforts in the strategic plan to make sure we're making friends of the international students who are here, getting them into American homes, making sure they're not in ghettos on their campuses? Yes, I mean, we're trying to work with, you know, the university leaders that I mentioned, you know, Chatham University, Esther Barazone is someone that's worked closely a long time with IIE, you know, ways that those, that the universities here in the U.S. are reaching out to international students on the campuses to help them. So we have a number of very, I, I would say, very visionary university presidents, community college presidents that want to do that. There are all kinds of clubs and advisors to those clubs and activities, but there's a lot more we need to do. Because students in general feel, you know, report that they, they, they want to feel, feel part of the campus community, but they don't know what to get involved with or how. So I think there has to be much better outreach. And I think, you know, when I talked about that strategy on interfaith dialogues, that was a way to bring not only international students, but U.S. students together in a campus environment, talk about religion, talk about faith, but also talk about other things. I mean, at our campus, we, we actually created an international intercultural studies department. And it was, it had the status, it had a dean, it had everything that it needed. And the students uh, really resonated with a number of the faculty in that department that became the advisors. So there was a much more strategic effort, but again, Federal government does not want to be accused of overreach. And we have to really encourage and support and use the kind of language and most importantly, show the role model, show where it's happening on different campuses. And that's why we just published actually about two months ago in the Federal Register a call to higher education in the U.S. to tell us what's working and why and what the evidence is. So institutions can send us, you know, in the interfaith dialogues, Every institution like Georgetown I mentioned has a plan. You can look at it on the web and see, you know, what are the opportunities to create more, um, more exchanges locally on these different campuses among students. So I want to thank, you know, all the professors in the audience here. Uh, Arizona State University is also one of the role models in international programming that, you know, we look at. And um, so many of you are teaching American and other, other universities here and abroad. But I just want to thank you for continuing this work. You know, one thing that happened uh, as president during my 16 years, I always looked for faculty that could speak a second language. And I, we didn't make it a requirement, but we made it a preferred qualification. So there are lots of other ways to then embrace, I think, a much broader and deeper cadre of professors to provide the leadership so that in K-12 education, we can have students coming out with two languages. You know, it's usually the relationships between the universities and K-12 schools that will lead the way, and this is what we look forward to. One last question. Okay, thank you, audience, for being so patient. He didn't give you a break. For, for, for me, it's just not a question, it's just a comment. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, Arizona State University, my name is Ozzy Romeo, I'm co-founder of a youth organization in France promoting the human rights. So I just simply wanted to express to you our sincere appreciation and gratitude, and also I appreciated a lot what uh, Mark said about cultural diplomacy. Uh, I believe sincerely that uh, the work you're doing, the vision you have for uh, the U.S. in terms of promoting education, not only in the U.S., but around the world, is one is tremendous opportunity for the development of peace around the world in general. Because uh, for many years, for the last 50 years, many development uh, efforts are being observed, but there is still a lot of discrepancy between how we foresee development in developing countries and even the U.S. itself. Uh, I believe that there is a need to really make a focus on human flourishing in terms of how, how we as human beings the education we have made us to be a better person in our society. So besides investing in infrastructures and other areas, I think education plays a key role in advancing our society and promoting human flourishing in which 
takes into account sustainable developments, ranging from economic, social, and cultural development. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just close with one comment. We published on the web, and it's free, um, a book uh, that was created by 125 scholars from the U.S. called The Crucible Moment. And in that, in that publication, and there are many references in the back, it talks about, you know, what does it mean to be an American? What are the values of, Amer of Americans? What is the future of civic education in this country? And at the end, it actually provides recommendations for business, for government, for education, higher education, and K-12 for community. And we published, as a result of that, uh, of that effort, a roadmap for that is called the U.S. Department of Education Roadmap for Civic Learning and Democracy's Future. And we have nine recommendations there that ties back to what does it mean to be a global citizen? What, what does it mean to be uh, civically competent? What does it mean to give back and care about the common good? You know, we've had so much in the U.S. about not in my backyard. Um, and we really want to turn that around to say, you know, we have a responsibility to people in our communities and people around the world. And this is how we want to express it in the policies and structures and programs and educational opportunities that we need to provide for more people, both here and elsewhere. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great conference. <laughs>